We had to spray it, I think, twice on the lagoons, and we had complete control. I have a fig that I got from Highland Lake Inn that Tresca Lindsay gave me, and this spring it had those bugs on it. And there's no kudzu up where we are, so maybe they're also getting on red buds. They get on legume trees, so there's something going on there that way. So is this thing... So take advantage of that. Let's see if we've got it now. We're getting further along here. Um, all right. So what we do really is we call it ecological pest management. Another name is integrated parasite pathogen and predator management. Back in 1969, Everett Dietrich. This thing is still. Let me try to do it from the. Yeah. Right. Slide. Yeah, on slide so, sorter. We can see so, it. It's big enough. I think she figured it out. It's a smart board. You can it click. Yeah, it acts like a smart board. It's not. Well, you don't touch the smart board. board. Okay, I won't touch the smart board. That's probably what it is. You're right. Okay. All right. So we'll leave it here. Okay, here's where we're at. When I scout my fields, I want a third, a quarter to a third of the insects that I find to be some type of beneficial or the evidence of a beneficial. If I find a pupil, you know, a ladybug pupil case, then that is a beneficial as far as I'm concerned, okay? So that, so we have all these different things. We have adult wasps that I'd see, I'd see lady beetles, I'd see larvae, cocoons, pupae, mummies of aphids. Oh, you're right, that's what it is. All right, thank you. We got it figured out now. And of course I keep touching the board. So if you guys are into statistics, you can do some statistics to do this stuff. And then what I want to show you, um, I'll start to show you some things that Patrick and I, uh, this is the first field of broccoli that I worked with. It had no farmscaping, raging pest control. And here's Highland Lake Inn. This is, this is Highland Lake Inn, Patrick Battle right here. One of the things about, I'll show you a bigger photo of this in a minute. But this is like a green firework because the way Patrick had this set up was when the oats dried out that he had as a cover crop that raised up all the ladybugs, all he had to do was undercut it, lay it down, and they crawled right into the kale. And then from there, they went over to the Jerusalem artichoke. Yeah, and I'll show, we have some pictures of all this. Well, but, and indeed, the before they dried yeah, out, okay. at the milk stand, You're right. I'm afraid. with Aureus and City Oats, it's the new pirate bug. Which is a very expensive predator and an excellent control for bricks and a lot of small pest spider mites and stuff like that. So it's just you get multiple levels of beneficials if you just let things be and create diversity. And some people like to take this farmscaping stuff and tease it all out, like Brinkley Benson. We got we got a guy up at Virginia Tech and he hated this BB50 mix because he said it was all erratic and everything. But you know what? I'd buy a 50 pound bag of that stuff. It cost me $200. We'd split it with about five farmers because five pounds of this stuff would seed an acre. And you don't want it real thick. And that's one of the things that we'll go over a little bit later. And so what happens is we had this massive amount of uh, beneficial insect blend. Here's an acre of garlic that we irrigated with um, HB nematodes and got rid of. This is at. Uh, Bo, uh, Chris Sawyer, what's it, Bo's farm? Jake's farm. Jake's farm, that's it. Farm. Well, there's Bo and Jake, I can't, those are, and those are the dogs. And of course, I go down here to take pictures of this. What do the dogs do? They start eating on the farmscaping. So I would always say dogs love its chewy taste. You know, they knew that I was looking at this. They're pulling it up and chewing on it. And it's like, something's going on there. So one of the things we want is we want these multiple redundant systems like we just experienced here. Boop, boop, boop. And then, the goal that we have, and this is where I'm going to start bring, bringing some of this around to hemlock woolly adelgid, we need a natural enemy that attacks every life stage of the pest that we have, okay? So one of the things that we do, we would lay out, if you guys see on your sheet right here, we take imported cabbage worm and Japanese beetle, and look at imported cabbage worm has seven stages that we can hit. Okay, and in fact, why don't you tell them about the, uh, one of the adult predators that imported cabbage worm? Yeah, that's one of my, my favorite stories. Um, 
Tyler Lincoln is all about gorgeous plates. I mean, chefs are artists, right? They're all frustrated artists. They all want to make these plates absolutely gorgeous. And Jackie Greenfield, uh, a good friend of ours, who will show up later this evening, I think, um, at that time, her specialty was to keep Tyler Lincoln supply edible and other, I mean, edible ornamentals, flowers, and all, anything that was gorgeous. Make sure those plates are gorgeous. And so she just scout whatever I had in. Crop. Purple cauliflower because half that crop is mine. Okay. Hi, Fuchs. I know it's all about art, you know. Um, I'm not a big fan of raw cauliflower. I turn green when you cook it, but yeah, I use it for the art, you know. Um, and then she starts seeing adult Victoria cabbage bird butterflies all over it, just clouds of them. And Jim Putz, who came down about that time too, said, You better spray BT. They both like, You better spray BT. You're in trouble, you know. You're in trouble. And I'm just like, I'm just going to wait and see. I'm looking, I'm not seeing much damage. I'm not seeing too many worms, you know? I'm just gonna wait and see. And about a week later I come out and there was this really falling down, now it's all rehabilitated, falling down an old red barn. And it had become a total condominium for house sparrows. Major pets, right? Not a good bird, right? Guess what? In this game, there isn't any good or bad. It's all just what's happening at the moment and in balance of current. Well, those those house sparrows want to raise their young, and they're looking for food sources. It was like a convoy. They leave the barn, go into the bowl, you know, this gorgeous vase of a, of a purple cauliflower, come flying out with green worms. Complete control. You never know where your control is going to come from. It's not just insects. It's bats. It's frogs. It's, as I like to say, it's your grandkids or your kids at a penny a bug, maybe a nickel for a really bad one. You know, it's it's all of nature part of your control. So you mm -hmm. just want to pay attention to all of it, you know, and actually speaking of Brinkley and him wanting the, the, um, the, the more perfectly designed farmscaping, I had written for this thing that we were, we were presenting up at Virginia Tech about leaving some wild spots, some ditches and stuff, letting them be weedy. And I, what I said was, those weedy areas, areas are your teachers. You don't know what's going to come from those. Just observe. Don't let them go crazy. Don't let them take over. But you can let a ditch be weedy. Brinkley was like, Pat, you can't tell farmers to grow weeds. <laughs> right. So there's a little mental thing that you've got to get over here. So if you look here, the other thing that was very interesting that Pat also told me about was uh, dragonflies attacking adult imported cabbage. All right. Flying up good. And seeing these things going sideways in the field. And, uh, and so... There's a lot of stuff out here that is, might be site specific to you that could work pretty well. The reason that I have a Jap the Japanese beetle here is, is we're missing a bunch of parasites for Japanese beetle. We're missing the adult parasite and we're missing the fall parasite. We have one parasite, we have the spring tiffia, okay? So that's one of the reasons that every once in a while we have a problem with Japanese beetle in the Midwest now is being torn to pieces by Japanese beetle because the common name of the Japanese beetle in Japan is the soybean beetle. And it also eats the tassels of corn and it also eats the, uh, the tops of corn too. So it will detassel corn where you won't get adequate fill. And so these are all things that, you know, that we need to go over. Did I hit this thing again? I probably did. Okay, so what we've got here then is just think ahead. I guess that's where we're at. Let me make sure we didn't go, we didn't skip a slide. Some time on that last one. Cover, cover oh yeah, 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 this is it. Okay, so the other thing that happens is once you've grown some of these crops a few times, you kind of know what the pests are. They're pretty similar, you know, I mean, it's usually almost the same pests over and over again. So you know, you may know that this time of year might be bad for diamondback moth or something else like that. So you're going to think about what are the natural enemies. And so what we end up doing is we take that we take, the, we take the pest, we spread out all those stages, and then underneath it, like you see here, you can do this for each one of your pests, is list the, list the beneficials that attack it. And then what happens, you'll see where you're missing stuff. Or you'll see where, you know, I could use another, oh, there's Teramalis puparum that attacks the pupae, okay? So we have this timing, okay? And that's why I'm saying here, work backwards from the pests to the beneficials that attack it to the plants that attract the beneficials, which sometimes are not the, yes, go ahead, Chris. Is there like an online yes. reference for, say, yes. I got squash, 
beetles. Yes. What are the different stages? Yep. Okay, let me, let me see if I put it on here. Flip over to the back. No, let's see, is it on here? No, it's not on the bottom. Okay, go to my website. Yes. Yeah, yeah, now that's good. Yeah, those are the two. If you go to my website, um, it's a little homespun and blocky, and I have, yeah, www.drmcbug.com, it's on here. So what, in fact, what Pat and I have been doing is we've been loading in all of these, all of our regional pests, and we just have pictures of all the different ones, okay? So that's, that's one of the other things. Now, here's the picture that I wanted to show you guys and that Pat should probably talk about a little bit, but let me, let me, let me show you what, what he's got going on here. You've got Jerusalem artichoke, so this would have been about a month ago. This picture must have been taken probably in September. Oh gosh, I forget that. Sorry. Can give you a pointer? Well, I, I'll, I'll remember now. Okay, so we've got um, Jerusalem artichoke, then we've got asparagus here, and he had his insects, his beneficials march across the field and then also come marching back. Because the other thing that you'll see out here, you'll see stuff like Cleome. Cleome is a great trap crop for harlequin bugs. I have a big problem with harlequin. All those bugs, I just love to squish them. When I see bugs, they're like bubble wrap to me. It's like, because I mean, this is when I'm scouting. Yeah, and, and I'm, squishing pest, I'm squishing pest bugs. So if you look at this here, is that the barn that fell down? Yeah, well, it didn't fall down. They were, now it's, oh. it's a house. And oh, okay, so they've got it all fixed up. Yeah. The other thing that I want to point out here was Patrick jump-started all his beneficials by starting them in this greenhouse. We had tremendous, huge populations of bizarre beneficials. We had mantispids. We had these really weird things. Early, you know, early in the spring, well, you open the sides up. You let those things out. You just jump-started your garden by a month. You just put so many other beneficials in there to ride herd and the really important thing to do with insects is always get on top of them right away if you've got to play catch up to insects then you've just played into their strong hand because what do they do they can lay eggs like crazy so, so that, that yes opens up a, a thing to consider and i already said it once but i'm just going to say it over and over again and richard's accused me of playing with fire but i want to i want to say to richard we, we as humans do control burns. Once in a while they get out of hand, but we do control burns. And I play with fire in that I encourage aphids. I encourage aphids in situations where I know that they're, they're brassic aphids or they're um, goldenrod aphids. You know, they're specific aphids, and I know that the crop that's going to be following is solanacea or something like that. The aphid is really not going to boom on that, on that very different plant. And that greenhouse, all winter long, we grew brassicas. We had flowers in there, but the truth is, you don't get too many flowers in March. I mean, they just don't flower that much, you know? We had, bad, we had some great ones that flower early, bachelor buttons, they have extra floral nectaries and stuff. So we had nectar, but the main thing, the men, I mean, literally, Richard, I remember being amazed, there were so many ladybugs, they were eating their own eggs. They were, they were laying their eggs on the walls of the greenhouse. I mean, they were, their density was so incredible. You know, and it was because of aphids of food, you know? Right. So that, that's the thing to remember is that it's, you, know, you don't freak if you see aphid populations. You stop and you think, does this population matter to me? There are times when it's windy, you don't do a controlled burn, you know? Right. But you, if you understand what a controlled burn is, you can play with fire. Okay. So. We're getting it. We're getting <laughs> Let's just take a couple plants that I really like. I really like fennel. I like bronze fennel. I like regular fennel. I can sell it. I pickle. I make, uh, I'm, I'm growing cucumbers. So my fennel, that's a farmscaping plant that gets all my beneficials in here. You can see here's a C, <coughs> C7 ladybug right here. There's four main types of ladybugs, which we'll go over. In, well, we have them on Dr. McBug. I don't know if we can get to the web. If we can get to the web, we can do it. So the thing here, as you think about this, is fennel is great for getting parasitic wasps because it's an umble. It has those little tiny flowers, and little tiny flowers are really important for parasitic wasps. So baby's breath, coriander, any of the umbles become very important when you are trying to encourage a big population of parasitic wasps, okay? Surfid flies, which are these little, you know, little green and brown maggots that eat aphids, those are good. 
And so one plant, even though we don't like to depend on this, and I'll tell you that I don't totally depend on fennel, I use a lot of it though. I use tons of it and it's edible. I'm all the time putting it in egg salad, tuna salad, you know, I mean, it's just got uses. And so this is the kind, when you guys think about the kind of farmscaping you're gonna do, work backwards from what you're already doing and if you're growing cucumbers, grow fennel, you got your pickling spice you can sell at the market along with, you know, that's what the way we do things here is we try to make everything an effective addition. You wanna get a chef to pay attention to you? I just did it with Hector from um, Salsa, right? I was touring him through this garden. He came up to the fennel and I just took a flower and said, so Hector, you just, Hector just got a farm. I said, you have this fennel grower? I cannot fathom how much chefs pay for fennel pounds. It's all the rage, right? I mean, can you imagine collecting pounds? I mean, how much per ounce? I mean, I don't even want to think about it, right? But if you have your own farm, you cut the fennel, right? You got some nice flowers sitting on the, on the bar. You want some fennel pound on a dish? You go cut a flower, you come back, and you shake it over your food. You have fennel pound all over your food. He was just like, why? And you just saved him a bunch of money, and yeah. it's probably the best fennel pollen he's ever had because it's fresh. As fresh as it can be. Right. There's no work. It's always there. You got it. If you don't use it, it just keeps on decorating the, uh, the bar. So. Right.